Hope, it's Rachel and Dan, and we're here to highlight a way that our new website will be helpful for you, whether you're new at Hope or you've been around for a while. So check out HopeChurchRVA.com. If you hover up top, you'll notice a tab that says Next Steps. There you'll find information on upcoming events, you'll find ways to connect with our family ministries, and find ways that you can join other connection opportunities such as joining a group, class, or find other ways to serve. And beside the Next Steps tab, you'll see resources where you can watch or listen to past sermons, check out Hope Music and listen to some original songs our worship team has created, or check out more resources like sermon discussion guides, links to things our pastors mention in sermons, and so much more. So check it out. Thanks for being with us today. Let's worship.
to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt just a moment. We're going to pray, but before we do, I want to tell you what happened to me this morning. On my way to Hope, uh, my gas light in the car came on, and there's a few different types of people in the world. Some of those don't mind the gas light, and it goes on frequently. I am in the category of it gives me lots of anxiety, and I am trying to find the first possible gas station I can. So I drove as fast as I could to the first gas station, and as I was filling up my car, I had a thought that this moment for us this morning may be a time when our souls are longing for something, we're in need of something, and we're here saying, I'm open. I'm open to see if this Jesus thing is real. I'm open to see if he can really give the forgiveness and healing that my soul needs. And so if that's you this morning, I just want to pray for you and with you that you would receive what God has for you, just like my gas tank, which is now full. (laughs) So let's pray. Father, we come to you so grateful for the promise where you say that Jesus is the one in whom we find true life. 
the fullness, the forgiveness, the mercy and the grace that we so desperately long for. So Father, for those this morning who are pulling in on empty, I pray that you would meet them in a special way, that they would experience your presence, that they would be invited to go deeper. And as they leave this campus or finish the live stream, that they would sense and know that you have done a work in them, that you've set them free, that you've offered that life that you've promised in a new way. So Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for Jesus. And we pray all this in his powerful name. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. And for those of you who uh, don't know who I am, my name is Wes Peterson, and I get to serve on the team here and welcome you this morning. And this might be your first time ever at Hope. And normally what we say is you can get connected to Hope by going to our app and saying, say hi. But today is a little different. We're encouraging you, if this is your first time, you'd like to learn more about uh, Hope and Hope Church, to actually go to our website, hopechurchrva.com. And as you scroll down, you'll see a, a section that says, Discover Hope. And it's really an invitation to a three-step process to get to know hope a little bit better. And the first step today, it says May 1st, but we're extending it to today. Um, the first step is to sign up to receive a 30-minute video from lots of folks on our team telling you about who hope is and our history and how to get p connected and plugged into what's going on here. And so if you sign up right now today uh, for the Discover Hope process, you'll get step one. And that video will come right to your inbox. And, and when you watch it, you'll get a little invitation from us to say, are you interested in step two? And you can find out more about that. And I think the step two date is May 23rd. So if you're interested in going through this group of Discover Hope, we encourage you to go uh, right now and sign up for that and be a part of that. It's going to be phenomenal. Now, I'd like to invite you to continue in worship through your giving. And there's a couple ways to do that here at Hope. There are some electronic ways, which you can see on your screen. And it's a, a chance for you to give uh, online, or you can use the text to give function. If you're here on our campus, you can use the wood boxes, which are uh, on your way out, whether you're in the lodge or here in the NPR. And you can put cash or check in the box this morning as a way to worship and celebrate and praise God for who he is and the generosity that he's had in your life. Now, we're going to continue in our worship as David Dwight, our senior pastor, comes to continue the series, the If Then series. And this morning, we're going to be talking about forgiveness. And we're praying that there's some breakthrough in our own lives and even as a community as God does a work through his word this morning. So, so glad you're with us. So good to be together this morning. Great to see you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Sorry, I'm like pulling my mic together. I don't know if you guys know, but there's this pandemic around. You have to wear masks, and then it gets in your mic, and then your glasses, and then the mask gets twisted, and you know, it's a mess. So since we're on the car analogies or the car metaphors, I've been thinking about COVID. You know how in a long car ride, it's like the last 30 minutes that you're the most antsy, or maybe the last hour, depending on how long it is. And like, say you're doing an eight-hour drive, it takes a lot of patience, but like you need more patience the closer you get to getting there. That's the way COVID's feeling to me these days. Like I think we feel like we're getting there, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. And like that last hour feels like it took seven hours. And anyway, we're all in this together. So in case you didn't know, there's a pandemic going around and it's... So if you've been here, you've been joining in on our series we're in if the resurrection is true then, what does it mean? Last week I was explaining how the word if can double in meaning with since. And of course, that's like the secret behind the whole message of this series. Since the resurrection is true, what does it mean? I wanna keep trying to stay close to it because I do think that Easter can come and go and we're like, oh, that was a nice Sunday. But Easter is the game changer. It's the history changing reality of the resurrection of Christ. 
So to keep putting ourselves in the place of the disciples, I'm going to keep referring to it this way. Jesus was raised four weeks ago, just four weeks ago now. And what are the implications of that? Because as a friend and I were talking about this, we came to this phrase, which is nobody expected nobody. Nobody expected nobody. And that's what they found when they got there. And the implications are dramatic. I want to try to take a few minutes today and orient us with the resurrection again. And then I want to move into the content on forgiveness. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, a little section, one of my favorites in the scriptures. But thanks be to God in his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, which is being kept in heaven for you. That is so chock full of incredible meaning. But I want to focus for a minute to orient us with the significance of the resurrection and its implications in our lives. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, being kept in heaven. Sometimes I think a lot of Christians think that hope is something like this. It's like an emotion that I'm going to kind of try to keep fabricating so I can stay positive in a hard life and a hard world. Almost like it's like a fire in the fireplace. And if you've got an old like wood burning fireplace, you have to keep tending it. You feel like I have to keep putting logs on it. I have to keep tending the fire. I have to keep that fire burning. I think for many of us, we feel like hope is like that. Like it's this emotional thing that we have to just keep tending to, to just make sure we don't lose it. But that would presume that hope is something we are manufacturing in us. Like we're trying to buoy ourselves up again for another day. And I appreciate all that that means. But what the Bible is saying is hope is very different than that. We have been given new birth into a living hope. It's been given to us. This hope has been given to us. It's not like a fire we have to conjure up and like keep hoping it doesn't go out. Hey, did you tend the fire today? Did you tend the fire today? It's been given to us. And it's a living hope. It's a living hope. And it's been given to us, how? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into what? Into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, being kept in heaven. So I remember when I was a kid overhearing a conversation once. I don't even really remember the context, but some people were talking about a guy who was like in his 30s. And they said, yeah, well, you know, he's never really taken life very seriously because he's a trust fund kid. And I didn't really know what that meant. I now know what it means. And what people were saying is, this guy grew up in a wealthy family. He knows he has a bunch of money coming to him. And they were being sort of derogatory. So he's never really taken life very seriously because he knows he's a trust fund kid. So if you go down that side of the coin, it's like the Puritan work ethic is saying, this guy's never really taken life seriously and done what he ought to do because he knows he has this big inheritance coming to him. But if you flip the coin, there's another side of that coin. This guy is not wigging out with as much anxiety about life as many people are because he knows he has an inheritance coming to him. OK, try to go with me on the metaphor. I've said it a million times. All the metaphors are partialities. They never cover everything. Everybody can say, yes, but, yes, but. I know that. But when the Bible says to us, we have been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ into an inheritance, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. We are all trust fund kids. And let's play with the word trust a little bit. We have this inheritance that's massive that is coming to everyone who has said yes to Jesus. Don't go down the pejorative road and say, so you can be lazy and do nothing with your life. That's not the point. The point is so you don't have to worry so much. We're all trust fund kids. There is this huge inheritance, this trust fund, Right, but let's play with the word trust a little bit. Its impact on your life is whether you trust that it's coming. Its impact on your life is whether you trust that it's coming. So the apostle Peter wrote these words, and what he's trying to say to disciples is, it's not so much that we have hope in the future, it's that we have hope from the future. Do you see the difference? It's a small turn of the dial, but a massive implication in our lives. 
It's not that we so much have hope for the future. We could all have hard stuff to come in the future. It's not so much that we have hope for the future. That's the kind of, I got to keep the fire burning hope. I got to keep manufacturing a positive outlook because, gee, it could be hard. What the Bible is saying is, no, because of the resurrection, we have this glory and in, glorious inheritance. The fact that there is an inheritance in the future arcs back to the way we live now. So our hope is this gift from the future, which is a certainty, a promise that is given to us from God. And how do you know it's a certainty and a promise? Because Jesus Christ is alive. And this is what the apostle Peter, if you know his story, he was a remade man through Christ and through the resurrection. He's saying, come on, everybody. This is what we've been given through the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is forgiveness. This is deep water. Now, if you've had a relatively unscathed life, you might go away today and say, I don't get why he got all amped up about all that. If you've had some really hard places, maybe we should add another really, really, really hard places. If you've had some things that have happened to you or been done to you, that are profoundly deep and violating, I am very aware that we're talking about sacred ground here, some of the most painful places of what human life can bring to us. But I hope that if we can grasp something of how the resurrection shines in these places of our lives, we can make little baby steps of growth in this area of forgiveness and pain, just like the smallest little sprigs of new green growth growing in our souls in places that have felt like they've become barren deserts. There's a bunch of places in the Bible that I love. If I was to say to people, hey, there's a few places you really want to know in the Bible, I'd say in the Old Testament, you really want to know Psalm 23, and you really want to know Isaiah 53. And in the New Testament, I'd say, you really want to know the Beatitudes, you really want to know John 17, and you really want to know Romans 8. Some of you are like, that's complete sacrilege. He just said, pick certain things and just dis disregard the rest. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but I think you get the point. Some of these sections are so significant in how they speak to us. And I think Isaiah 53 is like that. So we're going to speak about forgiveness today. If the resurrection is true, then we can become profoundly forgiving people. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 11 is our framework. You know this is speaking about Jesus. 700 years before Jesus was born, this is written about him prophetically. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely... He took on our infirmities and carried our sorrows, and yet we considered him stricken by God, struck down and afflicted. Okay, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can recount his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was stricken for the transgressions of my people. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And when his soul is made a guilt offering... He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the anguish of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. We live in a resurrection-saturated world, also a world where the price has been paid 
the price of sin, yes, your sin, yes, my sin, completely forgiven. Many of us live our Christian lives struggling to catch up to believe what is actually true. Completely forgiven. And he has provided this forgiveness to the world and people come into it when they say yes to him and trust him in faith. We live in a world where the price has been paid, a sublime and a severe price paid by Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament has all kinds of worship practices. Mostly they are all around the sacrifices that are going to be made in the temple. The sacrificial system was animals that were sacrificed for the forgiveness of sin. And the Old Testament gives continual hints that all of these things are temporary. We have to keep doing them, keep doing them, keep doing them until a once and for all final sacrifice comes and solves it all for all time. And so when the New Testament opens, and in John 1, John the Baptist speaks of Jesus, says the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What John is proclaiming is, look, the final sacrifice, the one who will solve this problem for all time, this is the one I'm talking about. This is him, this is Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, bear with me. Jesus' sacrifice is his practical ministry. His resurrection is his eternal ministry. You know, a lot of times in church, people will hear sermons and teaching and preaching, and sometimes people will say this to me, really appreciated it, but give me something practical. Okay, really appreciate it, but give me something practical. Practical means something that is applicable, that operates in my day-to-day -day life. That's practical and applicable in my kitchen. That's practical and applicable in my relationships with my family, my kids, my spouse, my friends, my boyfriend or girlfriend. Give me something practical. There is no more practical ministry from Jesus than his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. It is for the practice, the practical, the everyday interactions. And all that we live with, what happens with other people, the challenges, the hard places, the violations, the sin, and all that stuff that we also do. One of the things that Jesus taught is we human beings, we do have this problem. We see other people's violations as major and we see our own as minor. He says, our vision is skewed. You know some of his teaching. He talked about why do you see the speck in someone else's eye, but you've got a plank in your own? And when somebody else does something that harms us, we can easily go on and on and on about how awful it was. When we harm someone, we'll go on and on and on to explain and rationalize why, but, 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 but we did, but what we did wasn't as much and it, and so at the outset, Jesus is giving us an understanding. We have a natural built-in tilted blindness. We look at other people's violations as major. We look at ours as minor. And ours are always sort of explainable. Yes, but there's a good reason for that. But other people's are not, not the way we see it in this blindness. Okay, so we're getting in some deep places. His sacrifice is his practical ministry. You couldn't have a more practical ministry than to provide forgiveness for the pains and the sins that happen in life. His resurrection is his eternal ministry. And his resurrection is what ratifies and confirms that his sacrifice works. Here's what I want to say. His resurrection ratifies and confirms that his sacrifice is efficacious, that it really does work, that it really applies, that it's not a game, that it's not religion, that it's not just words out there, that it really is real, that his sacrifice works. The resurrection is what makes that very clear. Okay, there's much that we cannot control in life. There is so much in life that we can't control. One of the challenges is how much can we control? How much should we try to control? How much can't we control? How much should we let go of? 
Every one of us has our own journey in that terrain. But there is so much in life that we can't control. But here's the thing. The thing that we can control more than anything is how we respond to what happens to us. This is on the one hand really helpful and on the other hand really anguishing. Because what we want to say is, well, let's control it so hard stuff doesn't happen to us. We get that, but unfortunately, that's not reality. There's much we can't control, but what we can control more than anything is our response to what happens to us. Okay, so I'm going to get into some, I'm going to keep going deeper into the pool here. I want to talk about what I'll call the forgiveness crucible. You've heard the phrase, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Why is to forgive divine? I think in some respects because it's too big for us. When we're talking about the deepest, hardest places of life, we're like no match for this. The magnitude of what has to happen to bring about forgiveness in your deepest, most painful wounds and places where you have felt betrayed or violated or harmed, we're like no match for it. And this is why we struggle so much with it because we realize it's so big for us. To err is human, to forgive is divine. Why is forgiveness divine? Because God alone is big enough to address this. But we, us little human beings, we're like no match for this. It's just way too big for us. Its magnitude is way too big for us. So what do we do? How do we navigate this? Because when you've been really hurt, here's what we like to do. We like to throw fuel on the fire of our revenge fantasies. This is human. And it feeds our flesh for a time, and it feels really good. But while we're feeding our flesh, we're starving our souls. And while we are pursuing those revenge fantasies, we're all human. We all take delight in the moment of our revenge fantasies. It feels really good for a moment. But like an illicit drug, that temporary high has a life-killing result. And so... I came to this quote from Nelson Mandela. Maybe you've seen it. He was reflecting on when he was finally released from prison. And he said, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. So like, yeah, I could get out of prison, but I'll still be in prison. This is deep water. I know it, and you do too. In some of the most painful times in my own life, what I've learned through prayer and journaling and trying to grow in this area, when I was in the deepest places of pain, here's some notes. I can't forgive you, but Jesus can. And I'm giving my pain to Jesus, and I am trying to align my forgiveness effort with Jesus' forgiveness reality. Over time, in faith, and by faith, I am catching up to what he has done in forgiving you. And in this process, I am being freed and I'm coming back to life. So I'm gonna offer a couple of steps when you're in the hardest places of forgiveness and you're trying to break out of a dark pit that you can't seem to get out of. One, step one, Consider that God does forgive. When I say consider, I don't mean a passing thought. I mean write about it, journal about it, pray about it. Step one. Step two, accept that God forgives. It'll be really hard to do step two if we don't do step one first. So step one is consider that God forgives. Spend a day there. Spend a year there. Step two, accept that God forgives. Step three, I place my pain on Jesus and the cross. Step three, I place my pain on Jesus and the cross. That's why he went there. Don't waste the cross by not giving the pain to him. When we keep holding on and recycling it, which is very understandable, we're human. I'm saying this to those of you who may be really struggling. I completely understand it. But we can waste the cross 
And I think God would say, I paid a severe and sublime price by giving my son on the cross. And if I could say it, you're not using it the way it's intended to bring forgiveness about in the world. Step four, I allow Jesus's forgiveness to be given to the other. This is an internal, emotional, and spiritual place. Step four, I allow Jesus' forgiveness to be given to the other. You understand, right? Because I'm thinking, I can't do it yet. I'm not at a place where I can do it. But I am catching up to where Jesus is in giving this forgiveness to you. So he forgives you, and I'm giving my effort to him and as a step in the process, transitively, I'm coming to forgiveness because I'm letting him forgive you and I'm catching up to what he's doing for you. And then number five, I grow to embrace Jesus' forgiveness of you as my own. This is the best way I know how to teach this to you, friends, and I care a lot about this. I care a lot about the brokenness. I've been in a million counseling sessions with people when we're talking about the deepest, most painful times of life. Simplistic statements in this deep terrain don't work for me. And my sense is they don't work for most of us. So if we move along a little bit further, what we can begin to see is that resurrection living is forgiveness living. And then we have some questions. So if I'm to get to that place, what has to happen in me? God, where do I need to grow to deepen and to mature, to live a deep, meaningful human life with the pain that is inevitable? One, I think God would say back, accept the truth of your life and my redemption in it. This is hard. Let me read to you from a little book that I found very helpful called Healing After Loss by Martha Hickman. April 21st, Doug Hammerschold, can't pronounce his name, but he was the second secretary general of the UN in the 1950s at coming out of World War II. He said, we cannot afford to forget any experience, not even the most painful. If you're like me, what you'd like to do is forget the most painful, especially forget the most painful. So she goes on to write in April 21st century, there's an old folk tale about a group of people, each of whom was given the chance to throw one trouble into a central heap in the middle of the room. Then they were invited to choose one from the pile. They each ended up taking back their own. She says, I suppose this seems so right to us because we know we are, each of us, the sum of our experiences. And to negate any of those experiences, even the most painful, maybe especially the most painful, is to deny not only what we have learned from those experiences, but also our very selves. And I would add, and the redeeming work that God can do in our lives. Another piece of forgiveness that I think is overlooked, I've not seen much on it, is forgiveness is one part of the process, but grieving what's happened in a healthy way of grief is another part of what happens in the journey of forgiveness. Grieving something is to name it, to not beat around the bush with it, to state the truth of what it is and what's happened. It is to give it to God in the deepest, most profound ways of faith that we know how to do it. And it is to enter his healing and redeeming work in the midst of it. And then, and I think this is a big deal. You know, the more you have in common with someone, usually the better friendship you can have because you have more places where your intimacies can connect and resonate. When you've been wounded or harmed, if you've been violated, if you've been mistreated, if it's injustice or power or whatever it is, we will have an opportunity to become a much better friend of Jesus 
Because Jesus experienced these betrayals, these injustices, this torturousness, and he ultimately gave his life for it. If you've experienced these deepest places, there is an invitation for those who can see it, hear it, and step into it to become a much, much closer friend of Jesus. Some people ask the question, how do I forgive myself? I think this too is a process of growing into God's forgiveness. See, to forgive is divine. So what we do is we catch up with, we grow into the truth of God's forgiveness. After we finished the Gospels this spring, Elizabeth and I started reading in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 14 said this, for by one sacrifice, remember we're back to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, for by one sacrifice, read these words, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. In other words, what's being said here is you have been given this status of complete forgiveness. Perfect in this sense means completely whole in God's sight. He has made you and me perfect forever. Oh, yes, and we are being made holy. But he has made, past tense, finished act, he has made perfect forever. We can spend a lifetime growing into the truth of what he's done for us. Speaking of the inheritance that's out there for us, N.T. Wright says, it is our birthright as the followers of Jesus to breathe in true divine forgiveness day by day as the cool, clear air which our spiritual lungs need instead of the grimy, germ-laden air that is pumped at us from all sides. And once we start inhaling God's fresh air, there's a good chance that we will start to breathe it out too. As we learn what it is like to be forgiven, we begin to discover that it is possible and indeed joyful to forgive others. So there are ultimately two ultimate powers in life. Okay, ready? This is, this is not the kind of thing you hear every day. The two most substantial things you can do is you can kill a life or you can give it. I mean, this is what war is. War is the ultimate in darkness. And what is it? It's the ultimate expression that says we're going to use our power to kill you. The ultimate powers are you either kill a life, murder it, or you give life. You either give life or you take it. Much of Jesus' teaching was about the ways that our living can either contribute to giving life or taking it even if we don't actually murder someone, I think you understand. Much of his teaching was about how we either give life to people in our interactions with them or take it. Our actions, our thoughts, our words, they contribute to one or the other of these in our interactions with people. But here's the thing. The highest of those two powers is the power to give life because this is what God does because this is who God is. In Luke 23, 34, here's where we see it. In what appears a moment of utter defeat, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, is on the cross, and what does he say just before he dies? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. These are Jesus giving life through forgiveness, sacrificing himself on the cross. Jesus has already made the sacrifice. You don't have to keep doing it. And so the cross, in all ways at the moment, looked like a magnificent defeat. When in reality, what we see is that God only our God could do this. He uses it as the tool to be the ignition to give life. 
which is ultimately the greatest power there is. So in this deep terrain of forgiveness, we're confronted with either giving life or taking it. And Jesus has given us this breathtaking word on the cross, which appears to be a resignation of defeat when in fact it is the expression of the highest power, giving life over the darkness. Jake Morrill has written a book called The Art of Forgiveness, says, the forgiving heart comes about through long practice. It's the exact opposite of giving up. It's insisting that what happened will no longer define you. If the gospel is true, friend, and since it is, we live in a resurrection-saturated world, a harvest in waiting, a new creation pregnancy waiting to be born any day now. And Jesus is inviting us into the life he gives, and then he's inviting us through the depths of the crucibles of forgiveness to begin to catch up by giving it to others through him. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today and just to pray to you, we know that we stand before you and we bring sin. Our thoughts, our words, our actions, big and small. We thank you, Jesus Christ, that you have offered us forgiveness for by your one sacrifice, you have made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Lord, I sort of feel like I don't really know what to say. I feel like the Psalms say, as deep calls to deep, so the waterfalls rush over us. Come Holy Spirit into each of our lives. For those who are stuck in the dark downward spiral of pain, would you somehow, Holy Spirit, break in with the first glimmers of shafts of light? Would you help us, Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Our closing song today um, speaks deeply of forgiveness. It was penned in the 1800s. Um, so some of the lyrics may seem a little old-fashioned or difficult to understand, um, but I noticed as I was looking at the lyrics even this morning that each verse closes um, or it's bookended with this phrase, just as I am, Lamb of God, I come. Um, so let's sing um, just as we are through the forgiveness of our Father um, who loves us.
How about if we take about one minute of silence and just you pray and talk to God about whatever terrain is in your heart on what we've talked about this morning, and then I'll close us with a benediction. Lord God, our Father, we give you all these things. You know every word that has risen from this room in this minute. More than that, you know every word and thought that's behind all those words that have risen to you in this moment. So Lord Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, we thank you. Would you help us grow to catch up to the magnitude of the forgiveness that you bear for us and for others. And now as you go this week, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit who is at work in your life. And in every situation and circumstance, the ones that are happy and the ones that are hard, very hard, He's whispering to you, come closer to your Father in heaven. He loves you beyond your wildest dreams. Amen, everybody. It's great to be with you today. Who is the great King of glory? Seated on high. Just cry.